During World War I, Great Britain turned its mastery of a crucial technology into a formidable weapon against Germany. Today, another country is aiming to take over the same industry through one of its star companies. The country is China, and the company is Huawei. In this special report, we look at how the Chinese telecoms company is helping the Communist Party achieve its global ambitions, how far they've gone, and what Chinese dominance of that technology could mean for the world. Welcome to China In Focus, I'm Tiffany Meyer. One early morning in August 1914, just hours after World War I was declared, Great Britain did something that may have helped change the course of history. It sent out a ship that severed five German undersea cables. That cut off Germany's communications outside Europe. Germany's last cable was later also controlled by Britain. The British ability to read those messages eventually made possible for the U.S. to join the fight against Germany, which some would argue determined the result of the war. Britain was able to cut the cable because it weaponized something seemingly minor that later proved critical. London at the time controlled over three-quarters of all telegraph cables installed and virtually had monopoly over laying and maintaining these cables. Back in the present, another country is now seeking to take over the world's telecom networks with help from a major corporation. That country is China and the company is Huawei. In this special report, we look at how the Chinese company is helping the Communist Party achieve its global ambitions and how far they've gotten. This coverage mainly cites a report recently published by a French think tank linked to the French military. The 600-plus page report details the Chinese Communist Party's efforts to expand global influence, from buying up media outlets around the globe to control its own image, to trying to influence elections in other countries, to using trade as leverage to threaten and coerce others. We'll break down more of the report in later coverage, but for now, let's focus on Huawei. First, what type of company is Huawei? Well, the biggest chunk of Huawei's business centers on telecommunications equipment. If you don't know what that is, think about the towering structures hundreds of feet high made of iron girders. They are called telecom towers. And Huawei sells a lot of them, plus pretty much anything that helps you make phone calls and receive signal through your radio and TV. Huawei holds the world's largest market share of telecom equipment, taking up over 30 percent globally. And with that, many people using its products. Huawei gains a huge amount of user data, as well as control over critical infrastructure in other nations, something that often proves a critical point of leverage in times of war. That's why it's so important for Western countries to figure out whether the company can or cannot be trusted. One of the most debated questions surrounding Huawei zeroes in on its relationship with the Chinese military. The company has repeatedly denied having any political ties and is adamant about being a private company. But not everyone buys it. Many say the sheer amount of effort the Chinese regime paid to rescue Huawei's CFO and daughter of its founder says a lot. In 2018, Beijing detained two Canadian citizens just nine days after Canada arrested CFO Meng Wanzhou at Washington's request. But China allowed the two Canadians and two more young Americans also held hostage to fly home the minute the U.S. dropped its attempt to extradite Meng and allowed her to fly back to China. The regime did all of that, despite harming its international image in the process, which Beijing has been trying to cultivate for decades. The situation ended with China being called out for its so-called hostage diplomacy and thuggery by mainstream media outlets in the West. Though Huawei claims to have no ties to the military, the company's founder is a former member of China's so-called People's Liberation Army, or PLA. He's also a card-carrying Communist Party loyalist. A Chinese biography of his life details how he, quote, studies deeply the military works of communist leader Mao Zedong, absorbed their core ideas and incorporated them into building his company. One of those strategies that's still used by Huawei today is Mao's military method of starting in rural areas before gradually taking over cities. That's called surrounding the cities from the countryside. Mao used it to win the Chinese Civil War and took over mainland China from the former nationalist government. 
And that's exactly what Huawei did to take up global market shares. Using its low price advantage to start from less developed countries and rural areas of the U.S. and Europe, it gradually gnawed away at bigger cities. But Huawei's closeness to the Communist Party extends beyond ideology. The company itself has a history of working with some of China's most notorious state-sponsored hackers. In 2013, India's intelligence agency reported that Huawei was part of a core tech plan organized by the Chinese military. The company was allegedly responsible for researching routers and switches. India was concerned about the potential for Huawei to put malware into their products and exploit it. Years later, in 2019, Bloomberg reported that Huawei had teamed up with the PLA on at least 10 projects, ranging from artificial intelligence to radio communications. While Forbes reported that Huawei worked with a company who was charged by the U.S. Justice Department. That's for launching cyber attacks against American companies. The worry that Huawei may conduct espionage on Beijing's behalf isn't just speculation. The company's overseas behaviors are raising serious red flags. For one, the Dutch prime minister's phone might have been tapped. A bombshell report earlier this year says Huawei was able to eavesdrop on all calls routed through one of the Netherlands' largest mobile networks, KPN, including those made by the country's then-top leader. This is according to a secret internal report by KPN 10 years ago, but it was only recently made public. That's because at the time, the Dutch operator worried the report was too damning and that if the public learned about it, the company wouldn't survive. In another case, Polish police arrested a Huawei employee together with a former Polish Secret Service agent in 2019. Police say the two may have spied for China and tried to bolster Huawei's ability to influence the Polish government. Both men deny any wrongdoing. In fact, Huawei doesn't have to be a military-linked company to serve the Communist Party's intelligence goals. Under the Chinese regime's 2017 intelligence law, everyone is responsible for state security and therefore must hand over information to the regime whenever officials ask for it. To watch today's full special report, click the link in the description down below. We are working with Epoch TV, and all Friday special reports are published there in full length. Parts of China's Shenxi province are experiencing their biggest floods in close to 40 years, according to Chinese media. The prolonged downpour caused an embankment to collapse in a major tributary of China's second longest river on Thursday. Water flooded the nearby county, submerging the streets several feet deep. Chinese media says more than 17,000 residents have been relocated. Online video shows people being transported in cages. The woman in the video is heard saying that the authorities are forcibly evacuating them. Meanwhile, in another part of the province, flood water washed away the supporting structure from a section of railroad. The train tracks are seen suspended in mid-air. Authorities try to block off the flood by pushing a bus into the water. According to Senshi Provincial Meteorological Bureau, rainfall in the province this week reached up to 11 inches. The continued downpour in Senshi province is forcing authorities to release water from reservoirs. But they are doing it without sufficient warning. And as a result, tragically in one village, an elderly man was swept away. We interviewed his son to get the details. NTD's Don Ma has more. Heavy rain in northern China's Sanxi province is causing reservoirs to overflow. And in one village, local authorities discharged reservoir water, which swept away an elderly man. He was yet to be found as of Thursday. We interviewed the man's son to find out what happened. We used a voice actor and gave him a pseudonym to protect his identity. The reservoir from upstream released water, but before they started releasing it, we didn't get any notification. They said they sent a text message to a group chat, but the elderly people in the village don't even use smartphones, so they didn't know about the water release at all. He says that the village authorities did announce by loudspeaker that they would discharge water from a reservoir October 1st to the 4th. But on the 5th, authorities were still releasing water. And without further warning, they suddenly increased the volume of water released. That was the day Mr. Lee's father was washed away. He was 66 years old. 
I don't know what time it was in the afternoon. The upstream reservoir suddenly raised all its floodgates and released water. But my father didn't know anything about it. In the afternoon, he rode his electric bicycle home as usual. As he was crossing a bridge, the water swept him away. The bridge even collapsed from the force of the water. At about 7.30 that night, we heard that my father had been in an accident. After hearing the news, he rushed to the scene. We rushed over and found him standing on his electric bicycle holding on to a tree. Rescuers also arrived. They got about four or five meters from my father. They tried rescuing him twice and couldn't do it. When they tried getting close to him to save him the third time, they found that he was no longer there. He was gone. Mr. Lee says that they were searching for him on Thursday. They found his bicycle but didn't find his father. He says flood water was released again suddenly and they were forced to stop searching. Lee says local authorities have not done enough to deal with the floods. He says they failed to ensure that everyone knew about the discharge and suggests that they could have arranged personnel to be on duty in the village. Don Ma, NTD News. Thousands of Chinese migrant workers are protesting for a fellow worker who died. Wang Xi lost his life trying to recover wages he was owed. The tragedy began last Sunday in a city in the southeast province of Zhejiang where he worked. Online Chinese media says Wang's boss had delayed his wage of $2,800. But when he tried to ask for it, he was severely burned all over. That's according to a tweet of someone who says he's Wang's brother. He says Wang couldn't afford medical treatment and died two days later. Online Chinese media say local authorities released no details of the death. Now thousands of migrant workers from Wang's hometown are protesting in front of the local town hall. Numerous specialized police officers appeared on the scene. They stand together to separate the protesters. This issue triggered heated discussion online. A comment says, do you know what's the most powerful thing about the Chinese Communist Party? It's the best in the world at controlling people. Another says the delayed wages aren't worth much. They would rather spend a hundred times, a thousand times more in controlling people than compromise. Most migrant workers in China live a miserable life due to discrimination from communist regime policies. Most of them have a hukou in villages and go to the cities for work. Hukou is like a passport inside China. People are registered with a hukou at birth, which basically says you're from that area. If you move to another place later, you won't have access to the social benefits there. This is especially relevant for these migrant workers. Since most of them got their hukou from the villages, they have very limited access to city residents' benefits, such as education and health care. As a result, many of their children have to stay behind in the villages, and they suffer long periods of separation from their parents. According to statistics from China's Labor Bulletin, one-third of total Chinese laborers are migrant workers. For the past three decades, migrant workers have been recognized as the engine of China's rapid economic growth. But due to Beijing's policies, they are also marginalized. And stories like Wang Qi's are not a one-off in China. India and China reportedly just had another border friction. Indian media says about 200 Chinese soldiers crossed into India and that the Chinese soldiers tried to damage some bunkers. The reports say Indian soldiers intercepted all the Chinese soldiers and detained several of them. But local commanders were able to resolve the standoff and the Chinese soldiers were released. Border standoffs have been a long-standing problem between India and China. The two countries don't actually have an official border, and they set up an unofficial buffer zone to ease the tension. It's called the line of actual control. Troops from both sides had standoffs along the unofficial border line over the past years. In 2020, troops from two sides had fights over border disputes. India lost over 20 soldiers. Beijing says it lost four. And the two sides are still in the process of resolving the tension. They will have the 13th round of talks about it soon. Taiwan's president says they are not seeking military confrontation, but that they will do whatever it takes to defend their freedom. That's as tensions rise between the self-ruled island and its mammoth neighbor China, a strain that's sparking alarm around the world. Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen on Friday had tough talk for Beijing after a recent surge in Chinese aircraft flying into the island's air defense zone. Taiwan does not seek military confrontation. It helps for a peaceful, stable, predictable, and mutually beneficial coexistence with its neighbors. 
but Taiwan will also do whatever it takes to defend its freedom and democratic way of life. Taiwan has been seeking the support of other democracies as a standoff with China worsens. This week, it's hosting a group of French senators and former Australian leader Tony Abbott. Beginning last Friday, around 150 Chinese warplanes, a new high in cross-strait tensions, flew sorties near Taiwan. Although that appears to have ended, Taiwan has complained of activities like that for more than a year, calling it grey zone warfare. Taiwan says that's designed to wear out the island's armed forces and test their ability to respond. China claims Taiwan as its own territory. The self-ruled island is seeking a bump in its defense budget over the next five years, mostly for naval weapons. And now, sources told Reuters, small numbers of U.S. Special Operations soldiers have been rotating into Taiwan to train Taiwanese forces. They declined to say how long this had been going on, but suggested it predated the Biden administration. The Wall Street Journal also published details on the training, citing unnamed U.S. officials on Thursday. The Pentagon, which in the past hasn't disclosed details about U.S. training or advising of Taiwanese forces, did not comment on the deployment. A U.S. submarine hit an object in the Asia-Pacific region on Saturday. The military said Thursday they are not sure what it was, but there were no life-threatening injuries. A U.S. fast-attack nuclear submarine hit an object while submerged in the Asia-Pacific region. But the incident did not result in any life-threatening injuries, the United States military said on Thursday. The incident took place on Saturday, and the USS Connecticut's nuclear propulsion plant and spaces were not impacted and remain operational, the Navy said in a statement. It added that the submarine remains in a safe and stable condition. U.S. officials, speaking on the condition of anonymity, said the incident took place in international waters in the South China Sea. Fewer than 15 people suffered minor injuries, like bruises and lacerations. The officials added that the submarine was now headed towards Guam under its own power for further inspection. It was unclear so far what the submarine hit, the officials said. Apple has stopped its cooperation with over 30 Chinese suppliers. This, according to Chinese state media CCTV. The move could be due to the recent power rationing happening in China. Apple iPhone assembler Pegatron has already cut essential power consumption, and it reduced its overall power usage by at least 10 percent, which could affect Apple's production. World Journal reports that some Apple suppliers say the power rationing is not affecting production, but the newly released iPhone 13 is already out of stock in China. It has reportedly already set records for the longest wait time for delivery. In light of Apple dropping Chinese suppliers, broadcaster RFA says Chinese companies need to stop relying on Apple for business. Earlier this year, Chinese touch panel manufacturer Ofilm reportedly lost $9 billion in market value when Apple stopped using the supplier. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching. And before you go, here's a glimpse into next Friday's special report. Communist China is taking a massive toll on the environment, on land, in air, and underwater. The Asian nation is helping chop down trees, coming in among the world's top sponsors of deforestation. It's also overfishing our oceans, accounting for nearly half of all of the world's fishing activity. And last but far from least, it's polluting our air. In 2019, Beijing emitted more greenhouse gases than the entire developed world combined. In this special report, we take a look at the magnitude in which China is harming planet Earth and what can be done to stop it.